Hello hackers! Welcome to the automated vulnerability discovery module of Pwn College. Um, in this module we're going to look at um, how to automatically identify vulnerabilities. We've been talking about vulnerabilities throughout the entire semester, different types of vulnerabilities that you've uh, examined, understood, uh, identified in software and exploited. Now we're going to try to figure out how to automatically find these vulnerabilities and it's not easy, right? Um, so why do we care about automatically finding them, right? You've done just fine finding them manually. But if you think back to the beginning of the course, we talked about Phineas Fisher, the hacker that famously uh, brought down hacking team using an embedded device zero day that they found in one of the very few devices that hacking team had exposed to the internet. There was no publicly known vulnerability in these devices. Phineas Fisher just said, I will get into that device. They looked at the device um, firmware, identified a zero day and gained entry and started this chain reaction that basically destroyed hacking team as a company. Um, the bottom line is we're not keeping up. This is a graph of the number of um, CVEs, common vulnerability enumeration, a trophy that is given um, to security researchers that identify and report security vulnerabilities over time. And uh, you can clearly see a gigantic increase in the number of CVEs granted where uh, nowadays we are getting uh, at least twice as many CVEs as we did in the height of the you know early 2000s um, and we're finding a lot of bugs but it's valid to ask you know does this mean that you know maybe there we're finding all the bugs and there are fewer bugs out there right um, unfortunately this doesn't seem to be the case right if you overlay this graph on a graph of the lines of code in the Linux kernel over time from 2006 to the modern day, the picture looks grim. If we assume that code is buggy uh, to some percentage where every N lines contains a bug, which uh, is not an unreasonable assumption. Uh, it's not necessarily science backed, but uh, probably there's data that we could uh, look around for this. If we make this assumption, um, then we can clearly see we are not finding as many bugs as we should be finding given the increase in complexity in the software that we're working with. Of course, you might say, okay, but the Linux kernel maybe is growing faster than other software. But on a whole different axis, we have much, much, much more software nowadays than we did even a couple of years ago. Uh, the proliferation of, of millions and millions of JavaScript uh, frameworks and little helper libraries and, and all of this insane stuff. Um, the rise of GitHub, we have twice as many GitHub repositories now as we did just three years ago. It's a lot of code that is out there, possibly being used by people, probably almost certainly vulnerable, right? So uh, we need some automated way of identifying more vulnerabilities, right? Obviously, this isn't news. Uh, in fact, researchers have been thinking about this for decades, not quite back to 1949, but, but um, fairly far in 1949. In 1949, Alan Turing, whom you might know as the inventor of concepts such as the Turing machine, um, very important, uh, you know, figure in computer science history. Um, Alan Turing proposed a an algorithm that could be used to check a uh, large routine, a large function for correctness. Now, Alan Turing was uh, concerned about, hey, is this program written properly? Uh, we're concerned, is this program written securely? But you can make the argument, and, and various groups do make the argument, that if a program is written properly, it will be secure. That should be part of the proper specification. Interestingly enough, Alan Turing talks about checking uh, programs. Right, And the first time I read 
this paper, I was thinking, wow, this dude is so far ahead of his time. Talking about, you know, the, the verifier does this, the verifier does that. People are barely thinking about software in 1949. And he's already thinking about software validating other software. And then I get, got to a uh, part in the paper where something was phrased in a way that I suddenly realized, oh, Alan Turing is talking about the verifier, but the verifier that he means is a person that's verifying. This paper described the process that a human being should take to verify the correctness of code, which is a very interesting uh, difference to how cybersecurity research is done nowadays. Because all of our papers, when we uh, do cybersecurity research, for example, in my lab, um, discuss uh, how a, a, an automated system would analyze code and check it for vulnerabilities. All right, um, let's roll on. Um, in this module, we'll cover two main analysis paradigms, static analysis and dynamic analysis. The difference is, um, actually, this is a philosophical debate. They're, they're, these are muddy philosophical definitions. There are static techniques that uh, execute some code. There are dynamic techniques that don't execute some code. But the difference is, does your analysis technique execute code or does it not execute code? Specifically, execute the code that you're trying to analyze. Um, there are pros and cons to both uh, techniques. Let me fix this slide. I'll be right back. All right. Um, there are pros and cons to both techniques, right? The um, pro to static analysis is that you don't need to execute the program. This is humongously good. Uh, some programs are incredibly hard to get to execute. Um, I'll talk about that when I mentioned dynamic analysis. Um, another pro of static analysis, is actually, these techniques are very um, founded in very solid foundations that are uh, mathematically proven to result in success. For example, a static analysis could guarantee the detection of all instances of a specific vulnerability. Let's say a static analysis that um, describes buffer overflows or that identifies buffer overflows, buffer overflows could actually uh, guarantee the detection of every single buffer overflow. The problem is, this leads directly to the con, is that they're incredibly imprecise and they rely on so much information that they need to extract from the, the program itself without executing it. There's the, they can't actually like poke around at what's happening during execution. Imagine if you had to reverse engineer everything without GDB, that would be a pain in the butt. Um, uh, they require source code, even with, uh, not always, there are static analysis techniques on binding code. Um, we are researching some of them in our research lab, but uh, they suffer greatly without the information contained in source code. Um, and even with source code, they're incredibly imprecise. What I mean by this is uh, consider, I said, static analysis can guarantee successful detection of all bugs that, that you know, according to whatever specification they consider bugs to be. Um, I can make a static analysis. And I'll tell you that at every instruction in your program, you will trigger a buffer overflow. And technically, I've just found all of your buffer overflows, right? But that analysis is not very useful. Static analysis tends to be able to make guarantees that it will be able to find flaws. However, it will find a lot of what is called false positives, detections that are not actually the, uh, an, an issue. And uh, because of this, actually, static analysis is much, much less used um, than um, you might expect. All right, on the other side um, of the equation, dynamic analysis. Right? Dynamic analysis has its own pros. Dynamic analysis is when you run the program, for example, manually in GDB, um, but automatically in dynamic analysis tools. The um, pros is that typically dynamic analysis, typically, not always, doesn't require source code. It can actually run the program, uh, analyze what is going on, etc. Um, or let's say rather, there are powerful dynamic analysis techniques 
that do not require source code. And dynamic analysis is very precise. When it finds a bug, it finds the bug because it has just triggered the bug. That means it can give you an input, uh, input data that you can use to re-trigger the bug, which means that dynamic analysis doesn't waste your time with uh, false positives. Every detection is a true positive. On the other uh, side of that, um, you can only spot bugs if you have actually triggered that part of the code. This is uh, called false negatives, where if you just don't trigger uh, code, the um, uh, dynamic analysis system will fail to detect bugs there. It will say, well, it won't say there are no bugs, but it won't say that there are bugs. False negative. Um, this is known as the dynamic coverage problem. In order to um, reason about code dynamically, you need to cover that code. We'll talk about code coverage um, in another video in this module. Um, the other uh, non-trivial issue with dynamic analysis is you have to run the code to analyze it, right? So obviously, if you're analyzing object dump or something simple, that's simple enough. You just run it. Um, but what about complex programs? What about programs that require um, complex configuration? What about libraries? How do you dynamically analyze libc, right? Obviously, you need to be able to trigger code inside libc through different programs um, to, to see what libc does. Um, embedded devices, right? If you have a firmware sample like Phineas Fisher did for some embedded device. How do you use how do you use dynamic analysis to actually analyze it? That is a very much an unsolved problem. Um, and as a result, one uh, problem is that oftentimes, oftentimes you can't find bugs with dynamic analysis. Now, of course, dynamic analysis, uh, of course, obvious to uh, me perhaps, but not yet to you, dynamic analysis is uh, king in the current state of human technology. Um, as we'll talk about throughout the module, um, we are, as a society, able to find quite a lot of bugs using dynamic techniques currently, um, and static techniques are kind of catching up. Um, this wasn't always the case, but is currently the case right now. Um, Keep in mind throughout this module that uh, Mikhail Zalewski, and we'll talk about um, uh, who he is uh, a couple of videos from now. Um, Mikhail Zalewski uh, has this famous quote that all of this program analysis stuff right now is kind of, um, you know, just starting out, right? This quote's from 2015, five years later, it is still the case that the uses of symbolic execution, concolic execution, static analysis, and other emerging technologies to spot substantial vulnerabilities in complex, unstructured, and non-annotated code are still in their infancy. This is hard. This module is designed to give you a glimpse at the, these early stages, at what is possible, and maybe inspire you to jump in on the research being done to try to make this a reality. Um, this research is being done all over the place, including at Arizona State University in my lab, um, along with my awesome colleagues. Uh, if you are interested in doing such research and you made it this far in the course, shoot me an email and we'll talk. Otherwise, I'll see you in the rest of the videos.